okay, we, we can start. Let, let me uh, introduce uh, Andreas of Steinmeier. So Andreas is an assistant professor at University of uh, Munich. So he graduated from the uh, University of St. Gallen in, in Switzerland. So um, Andreas has been very productive in different fields, including um, labor economics, education, and of course, migration. It's the reason why uh, he's going to present his paper today with us. So, uh, so for instance, in labor economics, I, I have come across uh, one of his recent papers on uh, the impact of uh, having a, a regional accent in speaking the native language. So the penalty on the, on the labor market, very interesting uh, type of paper. And uh, so he has also some papers on the, on the education, higher education, uh, uh, and uh, of course on migration. So he has worked with uh, a couple of uh, people here, like uh, Ilel and uh, Thomas, on uh, the impact of uh, immigration on the institution and the political institution, for instance. And uh, today he's going to talk about uh, immigration and recession. So the, the title of the paper is uh, Immigrating to a Recession. So Thomas and Christophe will be with us. So they will be able to answer some different questions. Um, but of course, if there are further questions, uh, maybe we can ask uh, these uh, uh, clarifying questions to uh, Andreas. So Andreas, I will give you 45 minutes and then uh, we can have uh, uh, 15 minutes for uh, additional questions, so maybe more uh, serious questions. Okay, so Andreas, yes, uh, you're, you're welcome to start and give you the floor. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Michel, and thanks a lot to the organizers for uh, setting up this great uh, online seminar series and for giving me the chance to present our work here. Um, so this is a, a project that is joined with uh, Thomas Barspa and Christoph Winter, who are also um, on this uh, seminar. Um, and it's a topic, it's a paper on a topic that unfortunately has become uh, quite, quite topical recently. So we are looking at the long-term consequences of immigrating in good or bad economic times. But we're looking at this question uh, in the context of family-based migration. What do we mean with family-based migration? This is migration from an origin to a destination countries that is tied to um, family members in the destination countries that sponsor the visa of, of a following family member. And family-based migration is actually quite an important immigration channel in, in many countries. And that's certainly true for the US where in the last couple of years, if we look at new legal permanent residents, Family-based migration has accounted for about two-thirds of new legal permanent residents. So what you see here on this, uh, on this, in this figure is there is approximately one million new legal permanent residents in the U.S. every year. That's certainly true for the last couple of years. And about 600,000 or a bit more of them come via this family migration channel. But it's not only a U.S. phenomenon, it's also a, a very common in other OECD countries. So overall in the OECD, 55% of all new uh, permanent residents are actually family-based migrants. Family-based migration has certain characteristics. First, since the visas are not sponsored by, by an employer, but by a family member, the migrants typically arrive without a job and look for employment once they are in the destination. So they're potentially very susceptible um, to the labor market conditions they face at arrival and economic conditions uh, might matter more for this group of migrants than for other groups. The US family migration system has another feature, and that is that the number of visas that is given out every year is capped at a certain level. I will explain that in more details later, but the demand for immigration visas far exceeds this, um, 
number of available visas. So what happens is that uh, after in the initial petition that is filed, it takes several years until a family sponsored visa is granted. But once such a visa is granted, there is a limited time window for migrants to actually move to the US or they have to forego this visa. What that means is these migrants have uh, to make a migration decision far before they're actually able to migrate. So they can't base their migration decision on the current uh, conditions they face um, in the destination countries. So the macroeconomic conditions these migrants face are to a large extent beyond their control. So what we want to do in this paper to, su to summarize that is to understand what are the long-term labor market consequences of immigrating in times of low or higher unemployment. And in terms of empirical uh, strategy, we make use of these uh, visa waiting times that provide us with exogenous variation uh, in when people will immigrate uh, to the United States. So, this kind of contributes to a literature that looks at the path dependency of uh, labor market outcomes. So we want to contribute to that literature, broaden the evidence for, for immigrants, and show that these initial conditions can generate substantial heterogeneity in later outcomes that we see between different groups of immigrants. And then we go beyond kind of the, the overall impact and, and try to understand a little bit of what's actually going on. And we, so we look at downgrading in the sense that immigrants, whether immigrants would take skills that are, would take jobs that are below their skill level uh, if they face worse economic conditions and how family and ethnic networks the, the support they provide for migrants interact um, with the economic conditions that the migrants face when they arrive. To give you a preview on the findings, we do find that if migrants arrive and unemployment rate is one percentage points higher in the year when they arrive, we see very little effect actually on employment. So we see a small reduction in, of in the employment rate in the first years, but that converges back to zero, back to zero figure. But what we do see is we do see fairly large effect on real wage income. So we do see decreases in real wage income in the first couple of years by about 4% for every one percentage point higher unemployment. And then we see only slow convergence to a persistent negative effect of about two and a half percent that is there also um, 10 years after arrival. We see that this is partly driven by migrants being moved into lower paying occupations. So we do see this occupational downgrading as a reaction to worse economic conditions. We also do see that migrants increasingly rely on ethnic networks for their job search uh, when they face uh, higher initial unemployment rates. We also see that they increase the support they receive from the family, but they do not increase the usage of, of the public welfare system. And maybe also importantly, we do not see any subsequent internal migration. So we do not see that migrants would, would move out of areas that have particularly bad economic conditions and move to areas where the economic conditions would be. Um, let me be brief on the related literature. So we kind of connect to a, a literature that looks at the effects of entering the labor market in a recession. So this literature has mostly looked at what happens to uh, college graduates when they uh, enter the labor market in, in good or bad economic times. Um, and this literature tends to find longer lasting effects, but some convergence over, over the first year. 
case. So the, um, we do see we do see that for that group. When it comes to immigration, there is relatively little evidence. So there is some older papers uh, by Barry Chiswick and co-authors that some of them do find some long-elastic negative labor market effects of uh, worse initial conditions, others they do not. Um, probably the best evidence that we have is for refugees. So there is a paper uh, at looking at uh, refugees in, in Sweden, I, I think it was. Uh, and others, like one recent paper that Alert just learned uh, will be presented in this series next week, Josh Mask looks at refugees uh, going to the US. And they also see for the group of ref refugees that they are hit by worst initial conditions and these hits have some persistence and there is only slow convergence afterwards. We connect to another literature on the labor market assimilation of immigrants, convergence of immigrants' earnings over time. And there is also, I think, very interesting recent papers that look at the long-term effects of early labor market access for refugees. So there's two, pa two papers that came out um, recently. And what these papers find is that if refugees are barred entry uh, to the labor market initially, they have substantially lower employment rates several years after they would be actually allowed to enter uh, the labor market. And then there is kind of a broader literature that looks at long-term um, macroeconomic conditions during critical life periods, and we look, they look at how it affects educational attainment, subsequent criminal behavior, uh, socioeconomic beliefs, mortality. So maybe these are papers that are also quite interesting uh, given the current discussion of negative consequences of policies to fight uh, the corona crisis. Um, so what do we have in mind that is going on? Well, there is kind of two, two layers here. One is what happens in the short term. And there is ample evidence that entering a labor market in a recession increases the odds of unemployment and job mismatch, and this is uh, connected to worse labor market outcomes. We know that immigrants' labor market outcomes are more responsive to the business cycle than those of natives. And maybe one aspect that is relevant here for the US is these immigrants, when they arrive, they have very restricted or actually no access to the welfare system. So they may be forced to accept lower quality job, which, uh, jobs, which again might amplify the effect of um, the economic conditions at the level. So it's pretty clear that we expect some effects in the short term. The question is why could this effect be persistent? And there are several explanations that might explain why um, we do see effects not only in the short term when they arrive, but even a decade after they, they have lived in the, in the US. One is that immigrants may actually enter different occupations in the very beginning, and they might remain in these occupations. And in particular, that might be occupations with strong migrant networks, and these occupations might also offer limited upward mobility. So being set on a different on a different plane. Another argument that has been made uh, by Oreopoulos and co-authors is, well, there is a lock-in effect. Search costs increase with age and with duration of stay in the destination country. So if you're older, you don't want to move around so much anymore. Um, you bought a house. In the case of the migrants, we look at the lock-in effect might also result from the fact that the support migrants receive is support from the family and support from a migrant network. And this might be immobile support. So that also means moving around geographically might be more difficult for these migrants since the support network that they have is immobile. Another kind of factor that could be at play here are sparring effects. So if migrants have 
uh, education degrees from different countries that might be that which U.S. employers might be less familiar with. They might use past unemployment or wages as a signal for productivity. So having an initial uh, hit and being assigned a low wage because of a um, worse economic conditions might be per wrongly perceived by future employers as a negative signal for productivity, and that might also uh, create resistance. And for migrants, it might be more difficult to obtain destination-specific human capital, which again might, might limit the upward mobility that these migrants face. Okay, let me give you a very brief introduction to the U.S. Uh, family migration system that will be relevant for understanding our empirical. Andreas, sorry, just yes. one, one question from Amelie Mora. What about return migration? Do you expect a differential propensity to return for uh, family migrants arriving in different phases of the business cycle? So in, in general, we know also from other studies that family migrants have very low propensities uh, actually to return. Um, so we look at that and we see hardly any return migration for family migrants at all. So these migrants usually really, they, they come to stay. So return migration does not seem to be a very prominent phenomenon in this group. Thanks. Okay. So the U.S. Um, family migration system. So U.S. citizens and uh, legal permanent residents in the U.S. have to write to sponsor family members. So, in other words, they're allowed to bring in family members uh, on the basis of a family visa if they meet certain conditions. So, these conditions depend on, first, the status of the potential sponsor. Uh, it depends on um, the family relationship. It will depend on some other characteristics like the income of the sponsor. But then in principle, the US has a rather generous system of allowing the sponsoring of family members. The thing is that for many groups, the number of visas that is issued every year is capped. So there is a certain limit in visas that will be distributed to migrants every year. So what you see here on this table are the different groups of migrants and the people they could potentially sponsor. So if you are a U.S. citizen, then you can sponsor your spouse, your parents, and your unmarried children under 21. And there is no limit in the number of visas that would, the U.S. would give out every year. However, for all the other groups, let's take, for example, here the F2B group. So that is if legal permanent residents in the United States want to sponsor their unmarried sons and daughters. There is only 26,300 visas available every year to be given out to this group. Um, and so there is a set of pretty complex rules when these numbers could change a little. Uh, there is one rule that no origin country can receive more than 7% of all visas. Uh, there is other rules that if some visas from the previous year are unused, for example, also from green cards given to employment migrants, then the number of visas given out to family migrants might increase a little bit. But overall, since the demand for this visa is so high, there is very little um, variation in the caps that we observe. So. In practice, what that means is the sponsor files a petition that is then uh, processed. And if the sponsor is kind of found eligible to uh, petition a particular family member, then this petition will enter the so-called visa queue, meaning um, the U.S. will process all these petitions on a first come first serve basis. So what you see here is how long you had to wait in the past. And let me explain uh, this figure. 
here what you see in the x-axis is the year when we see someone actually immigrating to the United States. And on the y-axis, you see how long it took between the time an application, the petition was filed, and the person was actually allowed to immigrate. So, for example, for this F2B category that we looked before, unmarried sons and daughters of legal permanent residents, if we see someone who actually came in 2005, then this person has been in the queue for about eight years. So these are quite long waiting times for the migrants. And someone who would file a petition in 2005 would not know how long it will actually take until his or her visa is available. So that could, that time could go up or that time uh, could go down. The only thing this person knows is how long someone has waited who is allowed to immigrate now. So there is this, the U.S. publishes this monthly visa bulletins where there's, they publish the so-called final action dates where you would know they are processing visas now uh, that were filed before a certain cutoff date. And these family migrants, they're very eager and follow this development of this final cutoff dates very closely as, as some immigration lawyers uh, have told. But then once it's your turn, you have 12 months to actually file then the actual uh, application for the visa or your application will be forgotten. So you have a rather limited time window once your visa is available to actually start the process, file the application and move to the US. So kind of this, the consequence of this is that the economic conditions at the arrival are beyond the control of these family migrants. Well, first, they apply years before the actual migration date. It's difficult to predict how long they have to wait, and it's even more difficult to pre predict what conditions in the future will be. But then once a visa becomes available, they have a very limited time window for actually moving. So when the first file a petition, that's already costly. That costs about 500 US dollars to file that petition. So that's also nothing that someone would do lightly. If someone decides now a visa would be available um, and I don't respond within this year that is given to me, that means I have forgotten my visa and that has the consequence that I have to file a new application and I go back to the last place. So it's a very costly decision. Yeah, a couple of clarifying questions yes. about the, the system. So the first question would be this 12 month period of waiting time, or basically the, the window. Yes. Uh, the same for all types of uh, visas or all types of uh, sponsors. Is it homogenous across uh, sponsors? So this is the first question. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, to my knowledge, this, uh, this, is, uh, this is the same for all. And the only way to deviate from that is if you have like urgent medical um, uh, grounds to delay that, but you have to kind of provide some some proof to to actually uh, that you have actual problems uh, and you can't move at that point in time. So that's nothing that's easy to do. Okay. So there was a second question: uh, What if uh, immigrants uh, waiting in line uh, find a job in the meantime? Uh, and they are sponsored by uh, an employer in the U.S. Uh, what what happened to, to the queue? I mean, are they dropped out of the queue? And my understanding is that is it possible for them to change the type of uh, visas in the meantime uh, to get sponsored? And what happened to their family reunification visa? Um, so in principle, it's possible to change that if you find a category that would. Uh, uh, provide you faster access to the U.S. I think it is possible to, to go for that. It's also true that, for example, if the status of the sponsor changes, like goes from legal permanent resident to U.S. citizen, which could be beneficial for the waiting times, then also this is kind of the visa application is is upgraded. So these these changes are are possible. Yes. Um, Okay, and the final question, and then you, you can move on, is yes. 
is this uh, seven percent cutoff that you mentioned about uh, the share of uh, family visas? Is it really binding? Are there a lot of countries that uh, are constrained by this uh, uh, by this cutoff value? So the countries that are constrained are is China, India, Mexico, and the Philippines. So these are the countries for which uh, this seven percent cutoff is binding. I don't have the waiting times for them here. They are significantly longer than the waiting time uh, waiting times that I showed you on the last. Uh, okay. On the last. Okay. Thank you very much. So please move on. Uh, yes. So. Unfortunately, we don't have the data to see whether and how many individuals forgo their visa. That we have tried very hard, we have not been able so far to get this information. What we do know it is costly to forgo the visa, and we don't think immigrants would do that lightly because of somewhat worse economic conditions. And I will also present you some balanced tests later that we don't see kind of changes in the volume or the characteristics of migrant inflows or family migrants when times are good or bad. We furthermore see that family migrants overwhelmingly move to the location of the sponsor. So this is family reunification. So we see that they move to where the sponsor lives. So also the choice of within US destination is largely independent of our current condition. So this is, this is kind of the setup that uh, we look at. Okay, so our empirics data. So this is the type of data that uh, we would like to have. We would like to have data that tells us uh, when someone immigrated and in which state they immigrated, tell us which visa a certain person had. It tracks individuals over time, so we have panel data of of Ravaleo market outcomes and other outcomes, and we have a sufficient sample size. So in an ideal world, we would have this data. In reality, we have to use the American Community Survey that has uh, uh, advantages and disadvantages. Well, first, we use a repeated cross-section, so we're not able to follow individuals over time. But we do have fairly detailed information on the labor market status of this uh, individual, so that's, that's certainly a plus. We know the country of origin, we know the state of residence and the state of residence in the past year and the year of immigration. And we have some further information on household composition and so on. The information we are lacking here is, is the visa type. We don't have that. So we have kind of proxy who is a family migrant and who is not. We do that in three different ways that are all admittedly imperfect, but they all provide us with very similar results. The first strategy, and this is actually our main strategy, is we focus on countries that send primarily family migrants. So where a large share of migrants from that origin is actually comes in via this family migration channel. So we, we kind of experiment a little bit with different country selections. One is we take countries that persistently over time always send predominantly family migrants. Then we also have a dynamic country selection where we look at in a given year, was the composition of the migrants such that there were predominantly family migrants. So that's country-based identification of family migrants. And I'll show you a map in a second. The second strategy is based on the timing of migration of couples living in the same household. And that allows us to pretty cleanly, I think, identify the F2A category. So spouses, these are spouses of legal permanent residents. So this is a method that kind of has been employed uh, already in earlier papers but for example, by, by Borges and Bronas in, in 1991. And this, this second alternative strategy is for Filipinos, you have data from the origin country where we know exactly who is a family migrant and exactly which visa a certain person held. And then we use this data to re-weight the migrants, the Filipino migrants in the ACS data to match exactly the characteristics of the Filipino family migrants in the administrative data that we have from the Philippine government. 
So this is three ways of focusing on family migrants. Neither of them is, is perfect, but by comparing them and also by comparing them to other groups of migrants, we can learn also something about potential biases that we still might have. So what you see here is we grouped the countries of the world by the dominant mode of migration to the US. And what you see here is in red, these are countries that have predominantly family-based migration. In green, this is countries that are predominantly employment-based migration. Um, then we also have the refugee and predominantly refugee and diversity migration, and then all the other countries is we group them as mixed migration to the US. So what you see is employment-based migration that's mostly coming from other OECD countries, so from Europe, uh, Australia, Japan, and so on. Uh, India is also mostly employment-based. Countries that are predominantly family-based and that are particularly interesting for us are mostly the countries actually in terms of volumes of migrants that descend in Southeast Asia. So this is Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, Philippines. So this is countries that predominantly send family migrants to the United States and consistently do so over uh, an extended period of time. And then there is also some other kind of smaller countries that send lower volumes, Yemen, for example, and some island nations. But really the, the largest group of migrants in our data actually is these migrants coming from, from Southeast Asia. So we take the data, we look at individuals who live in the US somewhere between one and 10 years, and then we focus on individuals who are between 22 and 60 years old at the time of immigration and at the time of observation. So we want to look at individuals who are are active on the labor market already when they arrive and also when we observe them. This also has the advantage that it removes young adults that arrive as students or exchange visitors from the data that are not family-based migrants. And it also removes large proportions of immediate relatives of US citizens can be sponsored without long waiting times who often comes as, uh, as minors. So we work with a sample of working age migrants that arrived in the US between 1992 and 2016. So that's the period we look at. Okay, so what do we do empirically? So before that, maybe we, there is a, one yeah. of the interesting questions. So there is a question of David McKenzie. Okay. Uh, what share of family-based migrants are living uh, outside uh, the US? So he's referring to Mark Rosenwald complaining uh, when comparing the new immigrant survey data to the, the, the census measures that many migrants get timing misclassified with a survey return. So yeah, in part because they are transitioning from non-migrant categories. So this is actually fairly small. We have the number in the paper, I think it's just about 10% of all um, new legal permanent uh, or you green cards given to family members that are transition of status in the US. So that's a fairly um, small group for uh, for family migrants. Okay, thanks. And uh, another question is um, how do family uh, migrants compare to individual migrants of labor supply, job search, or, or maybe it's part of the uh, the next uh, part of the analysis, or uh, would you like to, to say something about that at this stage? So, in terms of uh, taking something, I don't have it on the slide, but I can say a little bit about the primitive statistics. So, if you compare family migrants to employment based migrants, so based on the country definition, we do see that they are have a lower level of um, education and they also earn far less. So Employment-based migrants, according to our country definition, on average earn about 53,000 uh, US dollars per year. Our family-based migrants earn, if I remember correctly, about 27,000 US dollars. So they earn somewhat less than natives on, on average. But their kind of 
level of education is quite heterogeneous between uh, countries, but for some countries, the level of education is quite high. So for the Philippines, for example, they have uh, about 50% have a, a college degree. So it's, this is a, partly is a fairly highly educated population. Okay, thank you. Please go on. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we estimate a model that is uh, quite common in also in the literature that looks at the long-term effects of, of regulating the recession. So what we want to do is we want to explain outcomes, labor market outcomes, employment rates, uh, wages, and so on, that we observe for a particular individual in a particular state that arrived in year M, and we observe this individual in year T. So one to 10 years, T is one to 10 years after, after M. And we want to explain that outcome as a function of the initial conditions. So what we do is we interact the state level unemployment rate with indicators for years in the US. So then we have a coefficient here for the effect of unemployment rate at arrival in year one, in year two, and so on, until we have that in year, uh, until year 10. So we trace out the full path and we see the dynamics of this path. So we, in addition, we include um, years in the US fixed effects to trace out the overall adjustment path. We include state fixed effects. So even though immigrants always go to where the sponsor lives, it might be that Immigrant communities in one state are different than in another state, so we take out any persistent differences here. And then we also include year of immigration fixed effects and year of observation fixed effects. So we really identify from variation in unemployment rates between states over time. And we include some individual controls. There is not too many that can be considered pre-treatment, so we include uh, the age of individuals, a person's sex, level of education, and the origin country. We have a second specification that we also show you. It's pretty much the same specification, but it's a little bit less flexible. So instead of having dummies for years in the US, what we show here is a fifth order polynomial, and that allows us to put a bit more structure and have less variance in the estimate. I show you results for both specifications. So there is kind of three main worries that you might have. One is selective immigration. First off, our definition of family migrants is not perfect, and people might choose to forego their visa, so that might create selection at the level of immigration. Simone, I think, also managed, uh, mentioned that there might be return migration, and that might also be selective. And there might be interstate migration, which might be problematic since we only observe where people live now and not where they arrived in this. Let me talk about the first two problems briefly and then the later one when I talk about the results. So here what you see, I'm not, will not go into detail, is that if you look at in, immigrants who just arrived in the ACS, so immigrants who are at most two years in the US, we don't see that their characteristics correlate with um, the unemployment rate they faced when they arrived. And we also don't see that the number of migrants correlates with the unemployment rate when they arrive. If we look at the full sample, we do see that there are some correlations, although they are economically rather small. Uh, but that might be the result of actually people moving around um, in the US, and that might create some imbalances here. So we do in include these numbers, um, so these control variables here. In terms of return migration, what you see here is the share of migrants that we still observe after a certain number of years in the US. So what you see for employment migrants here, the triangles, that goes down. So many migrants that come from countries with predominantly employment migration, they return over time. So that's consistent with many other, other parts. But for family migrants, we hardly see any return migration at all. So after 10 years, we basically still see the same number of individuals as we saw um, in, the, in the first year. So that's consistent with, for example, a paper by Dustman and Gerlach that family migrants and even more so Asian family migrants 
are least likely to return to the to their destination country, to their origin country. Okay, so let me get to the results. So I will present you the results in figures like this. So let me explain them here a bit more detail on the first slide and then put them on, on the next. So what you see here is the effect of a one percentage point higher unemployment rate at arrival on our outcome in every year after arrival. So what you see here is on the left, we see the effect on the employment rate. So in the first year, if unemployment rate is one percentage point higher, employment rate goes down by close to one percentage point. And then we see that after three, four years, this effect has converged back to zero. So there is, is convergence. So after four or five years, there is no negative effect on employment anymore. And the other thing that you see here is, so the connected dots here are the polynomial specification. The red hollow dots are the, the dummy, the fully flexible dummy specification. So on the one hand, on the left side, you see that there is a small effect on employment initially, but that is goes away pretty quickly. On the right side, you see the effect on real wages. And that effect is substantial and very persistent. So the effect in the first two years is about a one percentage point higher unemployment rate, lowers wages by about 5%. And then you see some convergence here, but even after 10 years, we still see that wages are lower by about two and a half percent. We do see that this is the result of a lower hourly wage. So that's what you see on the left hand. So overall hourly wage goes down by 2% for these migrants. And that hourly wage goes down, and this is what you see here on the right side, because of occupational downgrading. So here we kind of regress, um, we have as an outcome an occupational income score. So a negative effect on this score by about one and a half percent is the result of working in lower paying occupations. So part of the effect is explained by this occupational downgrading. So we have kind of worked it out and in levels to kind of decomposition the effect. So this is the overall effect after 10 years. We would see a reduction uh, wage loss of about 8,000 US dollars. And here you see how that um, splits up between Reduction in labor supply, reduction in the upper part here, occupational downgrading, and then there is what we call residual hourly wage. This is you earn less on the same job. So this is a reduction in wages that is not because of changes in, in the job, but because of lower wages for a given job. So this is the effect. Okay, um, what we show you here is the effects, we compare these effects that you saw before, the effect on employment and the effect on real wage income for different groups. So the, the blue circles, this is the lines that you, you saw before. And there is two groups that I think are interesting to compare them with. First is, what if we actually did the same exercise with migrants who are employment-based migrants, who come from countries that are mostly sending employment migrants. And this is this is the green triangle. And what you see is for these migrants, we don't see any effect. So these migrants, when they are, this is non-exogenous arrivals. But for these migrants, they actually come with a job. So no surprise that we don't see no employment effects. But we also don't see any wage effects. So we take that as as um, a signal that as far as our definition of migrants is not perfect, and in our data we have some of these economic migrants, of these employment migrants, we will have a bias of our results towards zero. So the true results, true effects might be even larger in that. And the other group that might be interesting here to compare to are native college graduates. So this is the literature that I referred to before. So we replicate these results and they look pretty much as what we see in the literature, so that's the gray line here. So what we do see is the effects for migrants are substantially larger than for college graduates, and they're also more persistent. 
So as a benchmark, migrants seem to suffer more from these effects than immigrating to recession seems to be worse than graduating from a recession. Okay, we'll get a little bit to why that might be the case. I'm skipping that further results slide. Um, okay, so let's look in the last section, look at coping strategies and these coping strategies at the same time might also explain why we see the persistence in the effects. So first we investigate the role of local immigrant networks. So there is a large literature that has established that immigrant networks, ethnic networks are an important support structure for new immigrants. So um, that's, that's well known. So what we want to test here is whether support provided by these networks might be particularly beneficial in a recession. So the, in the first step, we look at the employment and wage effects by the size of the network in the area where the migrants go to. And then we look at whether we see an effect in kind of whether adverse economic conditions or so higher unemployment rate at arrival pushes migrants to enter occupations with large co-ethnic networks. So we use um, established measure from the literature on the concentration of co-ethnics in different occupations in a particular area at a particular uh, point in time. So I should say we have to restrict this analysis to migrants from the Filipinos as constructing these concentration measures is only possible for this group that is the largest groups in terms of, of numbers that we have in our data. So what do we find when we look at this analysis? So here you have the effects, the average effects for the first five years of a one percentage point higher unemployment rate. And we interact that average effect now with the size of the network. So here the coefficient in the first line is if you live in an area with a small network, your employment rate will be lowered by 2.1 percentage points. And then here you see the interaction terms. So the interaction terms are positive. So if you live in areas where there is larger, medium, or larger networks, the negative effect is somewhat mitigated. And if you add the two up, like here, it's, it's about 0.05 percentage points. And a similar tendency here is visible for wages. So in areas where there is small networks, migrants, the negative wage effects are fairly large and the coefficients on the interaction terms again are positive. So there is some uh, mitigation. So networks help migrants to, to weather the worst economic conditions they might. And they do so, and that's now the, the third column. I think that's very interesting by moving migrants into occupations with strong ethnic networks. So what we have here is as outcome, the share of Filipinos that work in a particular occupation. And what you see is if you arrive at times of higher unemployment in areas where there are medium or large network, you are substantially more likely to work in an occupation where Filipinos are concentrated. So you're more likely to work and go into these ethnic occupations. And it's not true that you go into kind of not large occupations, which would be in what we test here in column four, or in general immigrant occupations. So it's really, it's you're going to these occupations where your uh, countrymen are particularly concentrated. So networks are important, but the other thing that is important is direct support for the family migrants. So let me kind of summarize the, the situation that these migrants face. First, they arrive. Many of them are liquidity constraints. We, we see them in another survey that we, we did. So they have insufficient savings to cover the migration cost and then the cost of living during a period of initial unemployment. They are not entitled to receive welfare benefits for the first five years in the US, at least first five years. That's and the sponsors are legally required to support the family migrants if they cannot support themselves. So meaning if migrants don't find a job quickly, don't get income quickly, they burden the family, which might create incentives um, 
to look for jobs for jobs. So, and this is exactly what we see. So first is, here is the effect of higher unemployment rate at arrival on the probability to receive any form of welfare assistance. And you see this effect is really zero as we would expect it since they are not eligible. As a proxy for whether migrants receive supports from family members, we look at whether in their household they live with a previous migrant from the same country. So whether they live most likely with the sponsor of their visa. And we see actually if unemployment rate is higher, they are more likely to live uh, in a household with the sponsor. And kind of that's also confirmed by other outcomes. So they're more likely to live with siblings, which is an indication that they didn't start their own household and they're less likely to be the household head. So it yeah, seems the support is really moving. The, if there is no sub public support, but the support is coming from the family and that might trigger them to actually accept lower quality jobs in order not to burden the family. What we also see here is there is no effect on geographic mobility, which might be explained by these immobile support networks that these migrants have. So no greasing the wheels effect. Okay, to conclude, so we show that these economic conditions at the rival have lasting effects on the labor market outcomes of these migrants. And interestingly, we see very small and short lasting employment effects, but these persistent effects on wage income and occupational downgrading. We see increased reliance on immigrant networks and that the social safety net is provided by the family, but not by the welfare state. In terms of policy implications, I think it contributes to the idea that the initial integration into the labor market is particularly important uh, and might have facilitating smooth initial integration might have positive long-term consequences. And kind of from a research perspective, I think it might be beneficial in future data collection endeavors to collect information on detailed visa categories that would allow to kind of exploit this waiting time system that is in place in the US uh, even more finely than we currently do. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, so we have uh, we have at least ten minutes for questions, but I see that the chat is being very, very efficient in the sense that there are hardly any open questions. So all these questions have been answered by by your quote. There is one, so maybe uh, Simone, can can you deal with uh, sure. any questions? Thank you. Rana is asking, can you explain me again how you compute the concentration index presented in some previous slides? Um, so this is um, the share of Filipinos in a particular occupation in a particular state. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for this clarification. So if we have time, I just want to ask one 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 question that I have. So Borjas in immigration economics provides evidence that there's a that for a lot of foreign born in the U.S wage wages are imputed they don't answer so it's for so i was wondering whether you have checked whether your results also hold when you only use non-imputed data so so given that you have individual flags or whether you can check whether the probability of imputation is correlated with initial unemployment in the state and year of arrival okay yeah that's an excellent suggestion we haven't done that uh but um we can certainly do that. Yeah, thanks. Okay, and then there's David McKenzie who would like to answer to ask two questions. I'm just gonna allow him to talk. Uh, David, if it works, you can unmute your microphone. Hey, um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I did. Um, so, so yeah, so so uh, thanks. Uh, so the first point was just. You know, is this all kind of trivial um, in terms of magnitude? You said these were large effects, but if we think like the gain from moving is 300% or 400%, then whether you whether it's 4% lower, you know, really doesn't matter. Um, 
you know, this is, I guess, the immigration literature versus the development literature um, question. Uh, you, you know, is and then the the second one was just um, I was just trying to think where the you know where the randomness is coming from here, and if there was a sort of way that you could better show it, because you, you know, at one point you talked about the uncertainty of when you get this visa, but it you know it, what wasn't clear to me is whether there's un whether there's randomness in terms of we all apply at the same time and it's and then you know it opens up for some people sooner than others because of that the, they're randomly sorting people around those windows and whether you're able to you you know it doesn't seem like you're you're using that because you don't know when I don't know if you know when people applied right you know when people sort of come in like ideally you would like to know okay here's the quota of people who applied this year conditional on applying some randomly got in in 2007 and some got in in 2009 and i don't think that's where the variation is that we're using the thread okay okay um yes so the first question I and mean, we had the, we had this is this is an excellent excellent question and we had this discussion when we talked about the policy implications so i mean what you see here is that this figure i had before like one estimate that we have here is that a one percentage point higher unemployment rate leads to a cumulative uh, wage loss of about eight thousand US dollars over ten years. So if you think about boom versus recession, where you have maybe four percentage points difference in unemployment rate, that's about forty thousand um, US dollars. So that this is a very substantial amount. So the question we asked ourselves was, um, well, would migrants, if we kind of increase the flexibility of the system and if we, once they had, once a visa was available, if we allowed them to, to move within a, a window of, let's say, five years, would they delay immigration if they faced a higher current uh, unemployment rate or worse economic conditions? And I mean, in absolute income terms, probably not, because as you point out, for many of those countries uh, where these migrants actually come from, um, the, the, the wage gain from moving from, from Cambodia, from Laos, uh, from the Philippines to the US is so large that they would probably move anyways, even if, if they would face, if they would take into account uh, these wage losses due to these persistent negative effects that we have here. So, yes, I, I don't know whether this answers your question. I think on the one hand, it's very substantial effects. Uh, if you look at absolute numbers, it, would it deter migrants? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, they would still prefer to come immediately, even if conditions are, are relatively bad. Um, in terms of identifying variation, I mean, Ideally, what we would want if we had the perfect data would be we would want to condition on the time when someone would apply for a visa or would, would petition and then the waiting times would be determined by how many other people also how many other people also um, uh, apply in that category and then there is some reshuffling between uh, different countries. Um, and that could then kind of increase or decrease the expected waiting time and it makes waiting time hard to predict. But I think that's not the key point. Even if you know I apply today and I will get my visa in five years and then I have to move, I don't think it matters that it's actually five years and you know if you, if, even if you knew the waiting times. What you cannot predict is um, is the conditions that you will face in five years. So I don't think that kind of the randomness, the random fluctuate, fluctuations in the uh, in the waiting times are actually are actually critical. I mean, what we cannot do, and, and this is this is also why the, I put on the the last uh, bullet point on my conclusion slide. We can't really exploit the differences in waiting times between different visa categories because this is what we do not have, right? We can 
broadly identify someone as a family migrant and we know these individuals have waiting times but we cannot kind of use the more fine-grained variation that would exist in this institutional setup but that we can't exploit with the data at hand. Thanks Andreas. There was, Michelle, there was also a question from Martin. Martin, do you want to unmute your microphone? Yeah. Thanks, Andreas. Uh, I wanted to ask you about whether the recession was also potentially having an effect in the countries of origin and that also mediate the effects that you're finding and what, what, what was the relationship also with remittance? If you, if you have any idea whether when there is a recession, these migrants would, have, would try to remit more or less? Um, so what we do have is in our specification, we include um, year of immigration fixed effect. So it's variation between in economic conditions between U.S. states. So um, if I'm correct, that should uh, eliminate any effects that kind of the global economy has. So I don't think that any effects can work via that mechanism of um, economic conditions in the origin country. There is a question uh, of uh, Eline Urard on uh, any effect on uh, social assimilation, so uh, intermarriage uh, rates, for instance. Um, do, do you have any idea about that? We looked at that, but um, we didn't. Uh, we, did, we looked at intermarriage rates as, as far as that was, was, was possible, and I don't think we saw any effects there, but if I'm wrong, maybe my authors can, can correct me. But I, I think we, we looked at it and maybe we should include it a bit more prominence, but we don't see anything on, on, on intermarriage rates. Yeah, I think we, we wanted to ask that because you have a strong effect of the network. So sometimes uh, if you are using more the network, I mean, it's going to lower your social assimilation. So basically, you have a consistent story. You, you should see a lot of uh, inter- uh, marriage rates within the, the community. Okay. Yeah, we have to um, we have to look at it. And partly, it's of course that this family reunification means someone brings in uh, the spouse, mm -hmm. and then of course for them, it's they are not on the on the on the marriage market, so we would not expect uh, effects for these individuals. Okay. So should we call the day? I. I think that we are at the end of the queue of questions. Uh, yeah, so I think that it's a, a good time to, to close the session. And uh, we, we first uh, will uh, thank Andreas for this excellent presentation and uh, also the nice job done by, uh, by the co authors. So, um, okay, so I think that maybe you're going to, to close the session, Simone. Uh, yeah, with a good last. Uh, thanks a lot, Michelle. I'm just. Uh... I'm just going to remind you uh, the, the list of next seminars, uh, starting with Yanai Spitzer from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem next Wednesday. And before this, the first session of the junior seminars on Monday from 4 to 5.30 p.m. with Joshua Mask on the paper that was referred to today, Andres Rosas Menak. So I hope to see you online soon. And thanks a lot for attending this, this seminar. Have a nice day, all of you. Thanks for having me.